I'd like to welcome you all to our second class today here at Saturday University. Um, we will hear from Mary P. Sheridan, who's an associate professor at the University of Wyoming. Mary earned her PhD from the University of Illinois at Urbana, Champaign-Urbana back in uh, 2000 and has uh, been working very hard since then. Uh, since arriving at Wyoming, Mary has actually produced uh, in some form four different books, uh, two edited textbooks, and um, uh, a revision of her um, PhD dissertation called Girls, Feminism, and Grassroots Literacies, Activism in the Girl Zone. And most recently, uh, is it out? Uh, uh, Design Literacies, Learning and Innovation in the Digital Age. So if you start on the boring side of things, Mary works on literacy. And you can up that a little bit by saying Mary is interested in composing in the 21st century. You have to throw in that hype, you know. That's what we've been doing for the last 10 years, the 21st century, as, as if there was some actual change at 2000, you know, Y2K and all that. Um, but what Mary's really interested in is how communities use writing. And she's looked at communities of girls and women. She's looked at uh, local uh, groups active in communities. She, for example, has published uh, about uh, a local activist community trying to post a billboard in, in an area of New Jersey and uh, worked through that. But what Mary's gonna talk to us today is about this ever-changing electronic world where we get to make things up and put them out there and somehow they all inter, inter uh, operate and impact the rest of us. My students keep coming, that's not actually a word, interoperate, but I keep finding it in student papers, so it's now, it's, it's in my head. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, uh, I'm gonna introduce uh, Professor Mary P. Sheridan, who's gonna talk to us today about keeping up with the Joneses in a digital world, Mary. Thank you, and thank you all for coming this morning. Um, so I'm the second of three speakers this morning, and I'm gonna be talking about my work, but I'm gonna really be framing about digital media more generally. And there seems to be a new word every year with digital media. So I thought I'd spend the first half of the talk just talking about what these terms are, what they mean, where you might see them, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about where I see this working out in education in some ways. Um, so I just want to give you this timeline. You don't have to make out all the words. I'm going to give you the highlights because I just want to give you an arc of what's going on. So in the, in the world of the web, there was the, P the PC, the standalone desktop computer, and then web one, web two, web three, and they're projecting a web four. Since web four isn't coming till 2020, and in digital media terms, you can't project out a year, I'm just going to stop at three. And so we're going to talk about what those terms mean. And on one side, they have some technology advances, which most of us never know. But those technology advances allow us to do different things. So I'll give you a quick arc now, and I'll talk about each of them more. But web one is really about static information, people being able to put that up. And that was pretty amazing. You're able to have an encyclopedia or a directory. All this information was available. Web two was really about interactivity. It was about people being able to change it, to make, to interact with the web page, to change knowledge. I'll be talking about some of those examples. Web three is where we are right now, and that's really about technology built into things. I'm gonna spend the next 15 minutes going over those ideas in general, but I wanted to give you that arc. And I'm also gonna play about three movie, or three clips today, and two of them are from businesses, and I do not own stock in either of these businesses, but businesses have to consolidate these ideas very briefly, and they offer, give a good overview. So I'm gonna play a clip that's called The Evolution of Web 1, Web 2, and Web 3, just to give you, to contextualize what I just said. And it's put up by a company called EPN. But with the rise of sites like Facebook and Amazon, the web has become increasingly interactive. On this web 2.0, it's mostly the user who produces the content. 
Without contributors, there would be no Facebook, and without people who post information on Wikipedia and their clips on YouTube, there would be no interaction on these sites. Meanwhile, most people have become familiar with Web 2.0. Blogging, tagging, social networking, and social bookmarking have paved the way to the next step in the development of the web. The step to the intelligent and omnipresent Web 3.0. Web 3.0 is not totally different from the web we know now. It is in many respects a continuation of existing techniques. Think of the so-called recommender systems that make a personal approach by a website possible. Amazon has cleverly used this system for a long time now by offering their clients products that other people with the same interests bought before them. And on Last FM, you can listen online to music that caters to your personal wishes. By using smart systems, these sites are in a continuous learning process and they anticipate what their users like or dislike. Important for sites like Last FM or Amazon is that a song or a book gets extra information added by the user. No sudden change of the internet, it changes gradually. What does change quickly is the look and feel of the web. Simply speaking, the internet is a web full of appliances that communicate with each other by exchanging information. As more and more everyday appliances are connected to the internet, think of telephones, washing machines and cars, the web is more present, but it will become less and less visible. No big separate computer, but invisibly present in everyday appliances. When, moreover, all these appliances start communicating with each other through the internet, this may lead to useful additional services measured to meet our individual needs. For the time being, we are not yet dealing with an all-knowing, omniscient computer which comes close to or even surpasses human intelligence. Writing computer programs which, in a human manner, convert data into useful information also known as the semantic web, appears quite difficult. But the web undoubtedly evolves into an environment which is intelligent and which will meet our wishes more often, more easily and automatically. New services develop because data from various sources can be linked more easily. Moreover, with the good and often wireless infrastructure, these new internet services are always and everywhere available. Your online agenda becomes a personal assistant which, all by itself, for instance on the basis of your profile on LinkedIn, Facebook or other information, will check your possibilities for new appointments and even take travelling times into account. Your destination and itinerary too will have been sorted out by links between restaurant sites, GPS information and local weather services. EPN, the Dutch think tank on the impact of information technology, approaches Web 3.0 from various points of view and draws attention to its implications for society. So they actually give you a little arc and I'll talk about more about Web 1, 2 and 3 as we go along now. So Web 1.0, um, lots of things went online. There was all sorts of information that you could get online. Um, and then the problem became, what do you do with it? So now you couldn't find any information about some random disease. Now you type it in and you have two million hits. You know, how do you sort through that sorts of information? So we were, one, we were lucky to get all this information, but then the question became, and how do you make sense of that sorts of information? So new problems arose. Um, in Web 2.0, this is something called a tag cloud. And what it means is it takes all the words about a topic and the words that appear a lot seem bigger and the words that don't appear so much seem smaller. So you can do this. We could do this for Jackson Hole. We could type in, in the last year, in all the newspapers, what does it mean for Jackson Hole? And a tag cloud would come up about all the different ideas that came about it. It's a really interesting way of sorting about what types of ideas are circulating around other types of ideas. So there are just a couple words I wanted you to keep in here, because I'm going to refer to them later. So convergence, design, remix, and participation. Those are key terms that I think we who are thinking about education should continue to think about. And that around here are just some labels that I didn't know if you knew what these were. 
Wikipedia. Has everyone seen Wikipedia? Okay, so Wikipedia, Flickr, Delicious. Um, this is Twitter, Facebook, and you do, and YouTube. And I'm going to play a clip from YouTube, and, and I'll tell you, this is a clip from a class. This person is at Kansas State, and he, each year, has his students do a project. And he decided, what happens if one year we do this project and put it online? Over four million people have seen this clip. And so that's the difference in education between you turn in a paper to the teacher and then I give it back to you, or you turn it in and four million people see this. So this is just the clip and it's called Social Anthropology and each year he says, what do we need to know about your class? And this is a four minute clip and they wanted to do it on what does it mean to be a student today? And this was in 2007, so it's really now, it will have started almost four years ago, and so a lot of the statistics will change, but this is what it meant to be a student in college in 2007, according to this class in Kansas. Can you see that? Are people having trouble seeing it? Maybe you could turn the lights down. Thanks. What are they? What are they learning while they're sitting here? The information is up here. Follow along. Of course, walls and desks cannot talk but students can. A vision of students today. What is it like being a student today? Add collaborators. Can you see it now? Okay.
So in this YouTube, let me just see how many, it's, you know, 4,012,626 people have seen this video. In each year he puts out a new one, he teaches Introduction to Cultural Anthropology. These are no people with special expertise. It's what does it mean to be who you are in this moment? Um, and they've got one every year, so if you want to look them up, go right ahead. Um, but there were a couple things in there that I found really important as an educator. And some of the things coincided with some of the research I'll talk about later, but the notion that how is a Scantron sheet preparing me for the 21st century? How is No Child Left Behind? How is the fill in the blank mentality of education and the chronic assessment in that way really preparing people for what they need to know? And that's a question I think we who, have, who are involved in education, who know people in education, really are tr struggling with. As a literacy scholar, I'm also interested in how Web 2.0 has changed the way we think about reading and writing. And so this was the article I sent ahead um, resources if people wanted to read ahead. And one of the ones was just from a Time magazine. So in 2006, the person of the year was you. And it was you because you created social media and the social networking. So I, this is from the article itself. Um, the cover and then the article, but I've added the labels because now information is situated very differently. You can face, the, uh, the, under the social media, there's the icon for Facebook and Delicious. You can put it on social media and you can distribute it. You can get it on your phone. And this is interesting. And I think, I'm not sure if it was the year, 2005 or 2006, three of the top five best-selling books in Japan started out as Mobisodes. The, they were installments, like Dickens, and you got them on your web phone, your mobile phone, and they were the length of two tube stops on the, on the metro for Tokyo. And then they were compiled into a book afterwards. And so this notion of how do you read, where do you read, how are reading and writing changing because of it? And on the bottom it says user-determined ranking. That says the most popular, and that's a changing link of all people that go to the site and email an article. So if you only want to read what's most popular, you can see what are most people reading? What are they talking about? So who gets to determine what is most popular and mo what is most valuable was really challenged in Web 2.0 when it was peer-to-peer -peer networking as opposed to only top-down. This is called Web 3.0. It's called the Semantic Web. And if you didn't know it was here, these are the first six hits on Amazon. Some of these are about computer programming, some of them are discipline specific, like about education, and then there is web, semantic web for dummies, for all of us who are just trying to get caught up on what's going on. So let me tell you where the term comes from. So semantic web is out of the linguistics language. It's semantic versus syntax, syntactic. So these two sentences semantically are the same. They say the same thing, you are great, and then if text speak would be you are great. Um, but syntactically, the, the, how it's made up is very different. It's called the semantic web because they're trying to get meaningful link-ups. They're not trying to talk about only how computers talk to each other programmatically with ones and zeros, but how do they meaningfully talk to each other. So that's where, just so you know where the background of that term comes from. But the interesting thing is about how things talk to each other. That was alluded to earlier. And this is a 30 second clip from IBM. 66% of new products have some kind of intelligence built in. Refrigerators order groceries from the store. Washing machines run when energy prices are lowest. And dryers cool for service before they break down. Air conditioners respond to local weather reports. Software gives businesses new ways to connect to customers. By making things smarter. Life gets better. That's what I'm working on. I'm an IBMer. I'm an IBMer. I'm an IBMer. Let's build a smarter planet. And so there's a real po positive spin there, but it's interesting how it contrasts, which I thought of the voice of that earlier video. She was omnipresent. It kind of reminded me of like 2020 and dystopic ideas. And I think Web 3.0 has a little bit of both and something that we should be thinking about. For me, I'm really thinking about security and privacy issues, and that's coming out in healthcare debates. So Web 3.0 has been really touted as this great solution that people in Wyoming Trish eventually care about once we can build the infrastructure. Because in Wyoming, we're gonna have health problems, healthcare problems. We are a very dispersed state without a lot of healthcare providers. So if you can build smart things into the 
technologies, maybe you can help. So for example, if you can build technologies into the walls so that you can see if there hasn't been movement for 20 hours, you know you should, that it would plug into a social worker who can make a visit to that house to make sure nobody's been hurt. Or if you can, there's this, um, I think it's 1.5 million pounds. The UK is just starting a, a whole community in Leicester um, trying to figure out how do you build smart communities and have all of this intelligence built in. So you can also have something like, it can be built into a pill box. So you can know if someone's not off their meds if the pill box hasn't been opened. So these are issues that are really people are thinking a lot about. Um, and the one very interesting thing I discovered is in Japan, apparently, they're building a lot of this technology into toilet seats because they said that's the one thing everyone has to use. If there's been no movement on the toilet seat, you can know, or apparently a lot of people die in the toilet. So if the body temperature falls below a certain level, it'll have an emergency call and have somebody come over right away. So there's a lot of interesting stuff going on out there. Uh, so all these things seem great. But I'm also very nervous about them. I mean, I wanted to buy, buy a yoga tape. I have a bad back. So the next time I went to Amazon, they said, since you like yoga, you might also like this. I'm curious who's keeping all of this information and what are they doing with it? And particularly with healthcare information, what if I'm a diabetic? I might not want that healthcare information floating around. I mean, whatever it is, I think there are a lot of issues. And while you know, no one's going to argue I, I want a dumber planet. I'm not sure I want, I don't know who has this information. Web 3.0 has a lot of issues we should be thinking about that are, we're being sold real possibilities. But I think there are some important questions that we might want to be thinking about too. I want to talk a little bit about how this applies to um, education. And I'm going to do that a little bit through my recent study. And so the impetus for the study was really there were a lot of calls for restructuring education to foster creativity and innovation. And they've been, they've been in all sorts of places. So the Spellings Report, do people know about the Spellings Report? So Margaret Spellings was the Secretary of Education under George Bush, and she convened a group and they were saying some really legitimate issues. We're spending a lot of money and we don't really know what's happening. And there were also several studies from businesses saying college graduates are really good at entry level work. If you tell them what to do, they're very good at that. And they are not very good at management. If you don't know what the problem is, but you just give them a muck, they can't figure out how to sort through the muck to figure out what the problem is. So how do we get an educational system that encourages this sorts of creative and innovation? At the same time, all these jobs are being automated and offshored, and they're not coming back. And so how do we figure out, how do we build a workforce that can do the knowledge work that can stay in this country. So there's a real economic drag by not having an educated workforce in this type of educated way. So I think they had the problem, I think they assessed it pretty well. But many of their solutions were similar to having no child left behind on a university level. A lot of standardized testing at the university level. And people were really opposed to that. And we were opposed to that because if you're trying to foster innovation and creativity, how does a Scantron test do that? And so there's a real problem with how do you have this mass assessment where you need efficiency, but you're trying to test something that's not efficient. And so how do you figure that? And I, we felt there was a real disconnect. And many of us felt that unless we come up with our own solutions, we're going to get something imposed upon us that we are not going to like. So this is part of a larger project of thinking about what should education be in the 21st century. We decided to, um, I did this work with a colleague, and we decided to work, look at um, what does, where would a site of creativity and innovation be today? And we looked at digital media producers. Not only because are they working with the tools of the 21st century, but they're setting up the environments in which most of us will be working. So how do we work in those environments? And so we had three questions. Um, what shared dispositions help producers successfully innovate and, create, and be creative? How do producers see their work in relation to, 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 oh, excuse me, to traditional notions of literacy? And then how can we adapt these dispositions to our classrooms? So we looked at groups of folk. We looked at some educators, some community activists, and mainly people in the marketplace. And I want to focus on the marketplace because we felt that's where so much more money was. There was just so much more money than there was in community activists. I mean, the, you go to the community activist center and then you go to Kuma War. I mean, like it was night and day. And so there's all of this money and effort going into those particular places. And I want to just talk about Kuma War. Does anyone, has anyone played a game off of Kuma War? 
So Chrome War is one of the many, many gaming sites out there. And this particular site recreates battles in Afghanistan and Iraq that have happened in the last six months. And um, but they partnered with the History Channel. And the History Channel said we could only partner if you'll do a world, two World War II and one, Korea, and one Vietnam. So they said yes, because they thought, well, this will be a great partnership. And so at the end of the, um, the History Channel episode, they always say, like, if you'd like to learn more, go to our website. And they would, in, this, in these episodes, they'd say, if you'd like to learn more and to even play a reenactment of these battles, go to kumawar.com. And one was the Battle of the Bulge, and I actually can't remember what the other two were. And so people came to this, but it was a really interesting idea because the demographic of people watching the History Channel is not the demographic of the gamer. And so you all of a sudden you have people of tremendous range of abilities all trying to do something. And the Kumu War felt this was a problem with eyeballs. They wanted to keep the eyeballs, the marketing revenue of people on their site. Um, but I viewed this as an educational issue. What do you do with a classroom of people with tremendous range where you don't bore people out of their mind who are on one end, but you don't lose the other half at the other end. So for me, this was a really interesting, how do you build environments where people can learn at their own level? And the, <laughs> the History Channel people showed up and they all died immediately. They all stood up and were all shot. You know, and they, they, they didn't get the gaming world. And so there had to be a big learning curve in how that figured out. Now for me, it was interesting because you could see how well they had done in their teaching by how quickly their health line was swamped or how quickly people logged off. And if they lo logged off, they lost that opportunity for that revenue. And so they had to respond very quickly. I'm really interested in how do we develop environments where people can learn at various ranges and how do we know what's working. And the marketplace actually had an awful lot to teach us. So I thought that was a really great site. We ended up writing about four core dispositions and four overlapping dispositions. You can just scan that while I'm talking. And I'm going to talk in particular about two in a minute just to give you an idea of these sorts of things. Um, and we didn't, and these are more of learning, big picture learning outcomes, but some of them we were struck at how different they were than some schooling environments in a no child left behind world, and particularly trial and error. When there is such pressure to make everyone proficient, or else your name is published in the newspaper, or else your school doesn't get funding. There's a real pressure on that, on not trial and error, on not exploring, on not the what if thought experiments that are really the higher order thinking. And, but trial and error was consistently a key disposition producers felt they needed. And it's something that I would think that we should really be thinking about how do we foster that higher level thinking in a climate when there's so much pressure. So I just want to talk about two um, of the dispositions in particular, and I'm going to be talking about um, design here. And I think of design in some ways, design is this term, and I'll talk through these in a minute, but it reminds me of a lot of educational research on when do you know somebody's learned something. And you know it through two ways. You know it, they have the tacit ability to just do it. And they have the a meta ability to when they see a new situation, be able to do it in the new situation. So you need the tacit facility and the meta ability of transference. Those are really hard. They may sound simple, but they are really hard. But that's how you know someone is fluent. That's how you know they've learned something. And I think the notion of design that's being bandied about in this Web 2.0 world really tries to get at that. So I'm going to give a talk about a quote um, from one of the people we interviewed. And he was talking about design is remix, which is reworking existing skills and things. And he said, innovative design is a new way of reading, seeing, interacting with, and understanding the world. You take these skills from the sandbox, and the sandbox is where if you're trying something on the web, they don't want, like at a place, um, they might not want you to post things, so they put you in a sandbox until you've proven you know how to use their site, and then you can, then you can go to your site. You take these skills from the sandbox, and then you go somewhere else that wasn't supposed to be your sandbox, and you make it your sandbox. One of the keys is the skills, and then you apply them in a whole new context. So this notion of remix has been around for a long time. You've probably heard it in music, sampling and those sorts of things, but it's also very prevalent in architecture. It's prevalent in lots of disciplines. But this ability to take something from one area and apply it to another area. 
that's really a high order skill and that's very valued in Web 2.0 world. And the other thing is convergence and being able to, um, this person was talking about linking functions and networks. This was somebody else we interviewed. He had this great title. He worked at eMusic, which is second only to iTunes. And he had a title like um, Director of Innovation in Emerging Markets or something like that. And uh, just kind of a title you'd love to have. And what he tries to do is he tries to naturalize change. So why would somebody pick eMusic over iTunes? And what he did is he partnered with movie theaters. And so if you buy a movie, you can download a free song from the soundtrack if you do it through eMusic. Or if you buy a phone at Best Buy, you, it comes with 10 free songs on eMusic. And what it does is when people get something new, they set it up to a default of eMusic as opposed to iTunes. And so it's how do you naturalize information? And that's really what education is also. You take a new concept and you say, look it, it's familiar enough to these past things you know, but let me stretch you and do something else with it. And so this idea of remix is all about transference and education and very high order thinking. And people in Web 2.0 are doing this all the time very easily. I think they're much more tacit than they are meta, but they are developing these very high order skills in ways that I think we in education are struggling to have them do. And there's something we can be learning from these environments. Design can happen in classrooms anywhere. So this is from an archaeological site um, that Berkeley's doing, and it's in Turkey. It's a Katalahoyuk. And what they're explicitly saying is we're putting up all the data online, and we'd love for you and your classes to use them however you want to use them. You can use them in math or in history or in any class you want. But they're hoping with enough people looking at this data that maybe people will find more in the data than this limited research team can do. So this research team from Berkeley is putting all of their information online and encouraging students to use this. Now why Remix seems like everyone's nodding their head, yes, but it's very different from the notion of an originary author. And I think we still fetishize an originary author. But really what I think we're trying to figure out in Web 2.0 is with information, the rate of information coming, we're trying to figure out how can you take existing sources and do something better with them. And that's really at odds with the way school has been set up. The second thing I want to talk about is creativity. And I think everyone would like creative people, but what they don't do is they create, I mean, creative people do not come from the head of Zeus. You know, you need to create environments where you can foster creative people. These are the conditions that um, Henry Jenkins, who was at MIT and now is at USC, and he's um, well known about participatory culture. This is what people are saying, thanks Paul, are saying this is what we need to do to be participating. Um, and I'll just give you a second to read those. And again, these are the sorts of things that are hard to assess. They don't fall neatly again into a Scantron sheet, but these are the dispositions I think we need to spend more time encouraging in classrooms. And sites do this all the time. This is a kid's site. I don't know if you've heard of Edgar and Ellen. Um, but on the right-hand side, those are all the ways you can participate. You can bring in art. You can write fan fiction. You can put in reviews. They're smart because they've said, we will take 10% of all comments we get online, of all fan comments, and work them into our plot. Now, it's smart because it gets people returning to their site, and they're watching their books, and, reading, and they're reading their books and watching the movies but it also really makes people believe that their contributions matter. And people are developing very sophisticated skills. People are, when they're saying like, oh, I don't want you to take that person's idea for the plot because it doesn't have enough development or action. I mean, it's the peer critique we wish we would get in schools. It's really engaged, it's very legitimate. Students are learning on their own to create video. I mean, they're spending hours figuring these things out. And these are the same students we're pleading with to finish to read the book. You know, and so what is going on here? I'm not saying we want everyone to be able to write fan fiction, but I am saying how can we motivate students to be this engaged in our classrooms? That's a pretty important question. This is also happening in adult sites. Have people heard of Second Life? Okay, Sec I'll give it a little brief explanation because I saw mixed results. Second Life is an online world. And you can just go there and be whoever you want. You can, these are all people, but you could be a dragon, or you could be whatever you wanted to be. Um, and, and universities have often bought islands in Second Life. And so it's been very successful, particularly in the languages. You can say, we're learning the vocabulary of food and conversation. 
you have to go to Second Life and I'm gonna get my 1,000 level class with my 3,000 level class. And the 3,000 level class are all gonna be vendors. And the 1,000 level class has to go and practice their language and you can only speak whatever the language is. You can only speak Spanish or French or Chinese and you have to make a meal. So you have to go to these vendors and barter and buy money and just practicing all of your language skills. But there are all sorts of other things you can use it for also. And people spend a lot of time, Second Life is tremendously <laughs> popular, um, spend a lot of time on Second Life. Um, and so one person, this is Sarah Robbins, she wrote Second Life for Dummies, but she's also a consultant to many universities like Indiana University. She created their Second Life Island for their alumni association and things like that. And she had a quote that I think is also interesting for education. You use new media like you use the media that came before it. You use a word processor like you used a typewriter until you get used to it. And then you start to play with the new features. I think Second Life is a version, is a new, is like real world 2.0, you know? People come in and they start to experiment and play. So as people get used to what the medium can create and what the affordances are, they get more creative and the mechanics create the culture. What you can do sort of starts to dictate what you should or shouldn't do. Now, I think that's really interesting. I am cautioning, I do not think there is a magic bullet with technology at all. Uh, I've, I'm mixed in my belief on that, but I do think technology is the medium through which business is happening, communities are formed, civic participation is happening, and I think that we need to experiment with what it allows us to do. So if we're trying to come up with environments that can encourage thought experiments, the what if experiments that are the high order learning of creativity and innovation, some technologies can help us create those environments. Um, I don't think it's inherent in it and I don't think it's the only way to do it, but I think kids are already really interested in it and there's a lot of potential in it. This is the, there's Second Life and Learning. They have a whole series up there because you can, I, we could have a class in Second Life where we'd never meet. We'd all just meet in Second Life. Um, and this is Sarah Robbins again. She says, there needs to be an emphasis on learning, learners creating their own content. So to use Second Life, for example, students should create the space that they most want to learn in and they should create their own learning tools. So definitely I support the idea of prosumer ed education of the instructor stepping aside and acting more like a travel guide and letting students lead the way. Now I want to caution this. People have said, well then why have a teacher at all? You know, just put them all loose in Second Life. I think that would be a terrible idea. Um, I think what we want to do is create environments and there is so much work to create environments. Like that clip we saw of those students earlier, those are very constructed environments. I mean, how do you do group work in a chair that doesn't swivel? You, how do you expect students to be independent thinkers when everything's focused up on the teacher at a blackboard alone, where I am all knowing and all knowledgeable and I have all the information? So if we want environments where students are engaging each other, are thinking about things in a new way, then we need to create those environments physically, virtually, probably a combination of both. And we also, if students are spending more time with digital media than they are in school, who is teaching them how to make sense of the digital media? Who is teaching them not to believe everything they hear and see and read? You know, it's kind of like, I mean, you could almost say if it was in a book, someone's vetted it. But I'm telling you, if it's on the web, it does not mean it's true. And so how do we get those students to know what those things are unless we encourage them to engage them and ideally produce for them and think about those sorts of things. So in this quote, Sarah Robbins is not saying teachers should just like let everybody free on the web. She's saying create very thoughtful spaces that encourage the types of activities that we want. Okay, so now let me just wrap up. When we're thinking back on education and, and um, issues in education, for web 1.0, the real question became how do we make sense of all the information on the web? How do we make sure we're not looking at a Ku Klux Klan site that's supposedly about racial freedom? You know, I mean, how do we make sure we do all of those sorts of things? Um, and that became a real notion of critical literacy. And so from the get-go, the web has been about new possibilities and the same old skills. How are you a sophisticated reader that you can figure out what's true and not true? As well as how does that manifest itself in a new environment? For Web 2.0, students are content creators. 
That has been fantastic. When students take ownership over what they're doing, they, you know the next group, after, when they, that video that we saw, when they found out the previous group had four million hits, you knew they took that assignment more carefully than many of the students who, you know, their papers do at eight, they start the, next, the night before at 10. You know, I'm like, you know there's a bigger investment in what they're doing. Um, but then they became content creators of giving out all sorts of their own information. So again, it's the same old thing. How do you know who your audience is? How do you prove your own ethos? You know, so it's the same rhetorical strategies we've been always teaching in a new environment. And the same thing with, with Web 3.0. It might structurally change the university. This has implications for the article, one of the other articles I talked about was saying, well, why shouldn't an intro to philosophy class taken in Maine count in Oregon? You know, why, it, why, aren't all, why don't we just make everything in every university homogenized? And I'm saying we are a long way from there. Uh, but there are real questions about how do we as universities communicate with each other about what does higher education mean across the country? And so I think there are a lot of questions for educators that are both very familiar and very new. So again, I'm just gonna finish up by saying in this, in this little chart of where things are going, it's not any one thing. And we don't know how it's gonna end up but I think that it's going to be here. And this is where information is, this is what business is happening, and this is where a lot of our students are spending a lot of their time. So how are we gonna get in the game and shape that both in the classroom and outside of the classroom? And those are the questions that I'm really interested in for what are students needing to know and how are they learning today? And that's it. So. <laughs> So I hear two questions and I'll see if I get, so one is what do we do with facts versus creativity? And then if we even want all this creativity, how does it intersect with our everyday lives? Is that right? Okay, so all right, I'll take those and then if you wanna follow up, just let me know. So the question about uh, facts versus creativity, it's a really actually very complicated question. And I'm sympathetic to the notion of assessment. So how do we figure out how to assess people. And so the ACT and SAT are examples. So on the ACT, and there, are, um, and there are also questions about individual states. So we have the pause test, other states have other tests. There's research done on Virginia and several of the other states that their state tests are disproportionately reproducing knowledge as opposed to producing knowledge. So the test is, you know, what color was the red, red wheelbarrow? You know, and so it, it's not that simple. But, you know, read this passage, what did it say? And much of it is a re can you pick out the facts in that? And I think that's a very important skill to be able to do, and many people have trouble doing that. I'm not diminishing that. But if our end goal is the production of knowledge, standardized testing just doesn't lend itself that well to that. But I'm sympathetic to people saying, but how do we compare the many people in many different places? How do we make sure that people are getting the core things that they need? So there's this real tension of a, we need an efficient standard, but sometimes that efficient standard isn't getting at what we want. 
And so there's this real tension where we haven't figured that out. How do we get an assessment for things that are not scantronable? Um, and some of those things are, you know, the writing test that's a little bit better. There's, you actually do writing before the writing test was checked out multiple choice. Um, and so, so there are some things that people are trying to do, but I think that's the crux of the problem. And if things are so high stakes as they are, the testing is so high stakes, you get in or out of college, your state gets funding, those sorts of things, people are going to teach to the test. And so if the test is about reproduction of knowledge, people are going to teach to it. And that's... That's disproportionately how it is. Um, the question about the virtual world is interesting. I'm not sure what the real world is. I mean, people's real worlds are pretty fragmented. You know, if you're a kid growing up in Gary, your real world's really different than if you're a kid growing up here. You know, it's so a real world, real world's not this homogenous thing either. But I can tell you that according to the MacArthur and the Pew Charitable Trusts, Kids are spending far more time in digital spaces than they are in many other spaces. And part of that is the loss of public space for kids to be. You know, it, there, it's not, no longer safe for people to go out and play all the time unsupervised, and they're no longer allowed in malls. Where are kids supposed to be? Um, and, and so I think a lot of kids, if they have to be at home, are kind of bored. So I think this is a much larger question as well. But I do think that they're, um, according to the Pew Charitable Trust and MacArthur, the majority of student, a majority of youth, which would be 17 and under, uh, I think it was maybe seven to 17, um, are creating content for the web in some way, when they're spending a lot of time in virtual worlds. And so they're already there. And so I think that it would be incumbent on adults in those worlds to figure out what, what are they doing in those worlds and how does it relate? And have that be an open question, not a judgmental question, uh, but figuring out what are they doing? And sometimes they're doing really interesting things. So, and I think the virtual worlds are also very, very different. Girls are spending a lot of time texting. They might go to sites, which is kind of like um, the U.S. Department of Education had something on for girls about media literacy. And what girls, so they embedded all these games in it, but they were trying to teach media literacy. And nobody went to any of the educational sites, and they all went to, like, the Cosmo quizzes. You know, and I'm like, well, that didn't actually work out as you planned, did it? You know, and so, so you don't really know how those things are playing out until you really spend some time with them and figuring it out. But of those, I think a lot of people are, are in and out, and it's really bolstering their face-to-face -face social life. The kajillion texts people are sending are not to people they've never met. They're to the people they left two minutes ago. You know, and so, the, so what's going on in those sorts of worlds? It's very fragmented, and I think people have a lot of anecdotal evidence and not a lot of um, in-depth research that's going on there. So I think we'll find out more as time goes. Mm -hmm. My sister said the, um, all the high schoolers and college kids, or a lot of them, um, they're competing with the number of Facebook friends, and um, some of them are spending three or four hours a day on Facebook. And then you kind of alluded to that in your last uh, response, but do you think that is a good thing? I don't know. I guess I'll take the old climate change. I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm saying it's happening. And so, um, so I'm not exactly sure. But I think that also Facebook is interesting because now the biggest single demographic are middle-aged women. So now it's becoming a little uncool to be because you don't want to be there with your mom. You know, and so, um, so things are changing demographically. Um, but I think... I think I take the stance that it is happening. So what are we doing about it? I mean, parents have been lamenting youth culture forever. And so, but what are we doing about that youth culture? So I'm more interested in thinking about, um, there was this interesting, um, I, I might get the specifics wrong, but this was the gist. Some, they, someone created a Facebook page about Lolita. They were reading Lolita in their English class and they created a Facebook page because the teacher said, what would this look like today? What types of posts would she have? Who would she want to friend? So she created this, but then some, according to his profile, middle-aged guy friended Lolita and all these kids in the class. It was really complicated because it was an ethical, they'd misrepresented themselves, you know, so then they told what they did and they got out. But I think that's an interesting thing. Other people have had Facebook, like create a Facebook page as if you were a soldier in w World War I, you know, if you're learning about World War I. So how can you integrate it in a meaningful way? Now the thing is, Facebook has a lot of very su superficial posts. And I think there's something to just getting writing and imagining and being engaged, but there's also something to in-depth argumentation. I am not saying 
five Facebook posts would replace a research essay. What I am saying, it could really complement it. It could be original sources. I use a lot of digital media, and I make my students do blog entries, and they have to do one each week, and seven have to be annotated bibliographies, which I call a webliography. And, and what it is, and so that way they can embed video, and they get lots of other people. Some people respond to it. So how can you integrate it in a meaningful way? There's something, a term also called the creepy treehouse. It's when adults like say, hey, I'm hip, and I'm using the technology. You don't want to create a creepy treehouse where youth are uncomfortable coming to your site. But you do want to create something that's meaningful for the students to engage in ways that they can find a way into the subject you care, want them to care about. And that way you can get the deep drill down knowledge about World War II or about Lolita or about whatever, as well as finding multiple ways for the students to find a way to care. I unfortunately think that's it for now. Yeah. Thank you very Thank much. You. Uh, let's take a break to about 11.30, uh, and then we'll come back and hear our third speaker. Um, and then don't forget that we will have a lunch and a roundtable for questions afterwards. Thank you.